Hi, lovely to meet you both. Congratulations on a brilliant and funny film. <laughs> so, The Miseducation of Cameron Post. For people who haven't seen it before, what's this all about? Uh, it's a story about a young girl named Cameron Post, and she's your typical average teenage girl, except for the fact that she's gay. She gets caught having sex with her best friend Coley in the backseat of her boyfriend's car on prom night. Uh, once her aunt finds out about this, she consults with the church and they send her away to Christian conversion therapy camp. And even though the film takes place in the setting of conversion therapy camp and the psycho manipulation that takes place there, it focuses on the interpersonal relationships of being a gay person and meeting other gay people like yourself for the very first time and realizing that you're not alone. And it seems to me the film really manages to resist resorting to any kind of stereotypes, cliches, you know, dealing with quite a taboo topic. Was it really important that you handled the material in that way? Yeah, I don't want to watch a film that's cliched and depressing. I want to watch something fun and sexy and hilarious and that pokes fun at the experience of being a teenager. I wanted to make a film that felt like a John Hughes film, but spoke to my experiences of growing up queer. Uh, I don't think that smart films about important subject matter should feel like taking your medicine. And you've got some incredible talent to work with, you know, they really bring out nuance in their characters. So how was it for you all working together? Incredible. Everyone, the, the actors all brought out the best in each other. Jennifer Ely has been doing this forever. She's one of my favorite actresses. And to watch her and Chloe in a scene together mm -hmm. was invigorating. It was like watching two pros uh, battling it out. They inspired each other. Were there any particularly challenging moments to film? Yeah, I mean, I would say our most challenging moment was uh, we started the, filming the movie in Obama era, and halfway through filming the movie, uh, Trump was elected president in America, which was a really harrowing day in of itself. But on top of that, we had to film that day probably the happiest scene of the movie, where I jump on the table and I sing karaoke to Four Non Blondes. And that juxtaposition was something that I really fed on, and I think we all did. And we pushed all of our oppression and sadness and anger and fear that we felt in that moment into that scene to give it its all, because in that moment we realized that this was the highest form of activism, the highest form of rebellion that we could do against the administration and against the system, and standing up for what we believe in, what we think is right. And the scene is a really, is is a testament to Chloe and her professionalism and her her passion for the work she does. We were all crying behind the cameras. She was jumping on stage and singing your heart out and laughing and, and putting every bit of emotion into her performance. I mean, the film's already had the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. You know, do you think there's more recognition now for female-driven stories? And how important do you think it is that they make it into the mainstream? I think it's I really so. important. I think that movies shape our memories shape our opinions, shape our lives in a really intimate way. I was raised on Mel Brooks, I was raised on Tracy Ullman. That's where a lot of everything I knew about sex I saw on a screen. And I was misinformed about a lot of things. And I yeah. would like to add a conversation that's a little more honest, a little more authentic, and has the balls to say things that people shouldn't say in public. So the more we recognize these films, the more money and power is given to women to make decisions, the more we're humanized in stories. I mean, there's a reason why we get paid less and raped more, because we're not seen as real people in our media. So it's very simplistic, but it's yeah. true. So if you give a voice to women and empower them to see themselves on screen and tell their stories, change happens on a social level. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> so simple. That was like a good rally. Okay. Thanks for your time. No dream. You know, I think it was the idea of that societal planting of self-doubt. I remember when I was when I was younger, and I still deal with it obviously on a daily basis, being a human. Um, but the first time I ever doubted myself was from other people's ideals being projected onto me. The first time I ever felt inadequate was from someone saying something about who I was that I had never personally felt immediately. And so I thought it was very interesting to play with that idea of societal oppressions and how you can be forced to believe something about yourself and, 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 uh, and, and how that depicts itself in, in a teenager, um, especially someone that's dealing with their sexuality. Well, I think the some of the most beautiful moments in this story, at least for me as an audience member when I watched it, um, are the the intimate uh, sex scenes that we shot. And I think it's because you, you really see the confidence budding within her sexuality. And you see, first and foremost, that the relationship with her and Coley 
was not fleeting. It was not silly. It was very intimate. It was very real. It was very passionate. And um, it, it kind of breaks away the ideal that this is just, you know, kids yeah. being kids in a lot of ways. It's also the excitement of First Love, to relate, to have an audience member, particularly a straight audience member right. who feels so alienated from the gay community, to watch young and love and the authenticity it. of it right. and the excitement of it and to relate, to be like, oh yeah, my first love was felt just similar. Like that. That is exciting to me. Agreed. I think that people won't expect what a universal theme this story is. You know, I keep saying it, but it's, I mean, it's the breakfast club for all intents and purposes, but it takes place with a bunch of gay kids at the conversion therapy center, you know, not in detention at school. Um, it's the same band of misfits that we can all connect to and, and inherently understand what it's like to be a teenager questioning who they are and what they're feeling within themselves and their 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 struggle with their identity. But it's funnier um, and sexier than they'll expect, I think. It's much funnier than they'll expect. Like, I think much people sexier. will go in thinking, oh, the Flame Rats drama. But actually, Chloe is hilarious in this film. And <laughs> Chloe has a lot of sex in this film. I mean... Sorry. Not, yeah, but it's honest and it's cool and it's the kind of sexual coming of age I want to see from young <laughs> actors. Something honest and authentic. Not some male gazy, creepy voyeur voyeuristic, bullshit. yeah, gross depiction of sexuality. I think it's a fun film. Yeah. If you're gonna make a film about gay conversion therapy, Chloe's <laughs> well, really funny and she has a she, lot of sex in this movie. It's a fun one. That should be our tagline. Yeah, it's a on fun the one. Poster. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, the film sells itself. Sold. There you go. There you go. Thank you so much. You so want laughter? Thank you you <laughs> want sex? Go see it. Yeah. <laughs> it was really, um, it was a beautiful experience. You know, I got to shoot a movie in 23 days. The last movie that I shot, we shot over four and a half months for over 50 million dollars. None of us had a personal connection to anyone on the cast. We hardly knew our director, much less uh, the other actors on our set. So to go from that um, and my light within myself dwindling to reigniting that flame and working on a 23-day shoot, under a million dollars, living all together, having bonfires every Saturday night, which is our only night off on a six-day week. Dance off. It was, it was invigorating, it was enlightening, and it was... It was a moment of looking in the mirror and finally finding my identity, which I felt like was fading very quickly, and that worried me. All of it was relevant. All of it was stuff we sourced and, and was, we're looking at. We looked at Lynn Ramsey's Morvern Caller as well, and uh, Todd Haynes is safe. But yeah, to me, it was like a teen movie in the vein of the best teen movies, and I felt like it had been decades since I'd seen something that spoke honestly to the ugliness and the hilarity of being a teenager that wasn't trying to please the most like and tick the most people or tick the most pretty, boxes yeah. and wasn't trying to be inoffensive. I, I wanted to go there and to make a film that felt as messy and sexy and uh, angsty and pathetic as what it actually felt like to be a teenager. I'm so thrilled. And our best release this year. Um, I'm, I smile when you say, sorry to bother me, it's such a great film and it is getting it's so well loved in the States and was given such a beautiful release. And it really says a lot about race in U Europe and UK where they feel they can't sell here. Um, but weirdly enough, this film has gotten a lot of love here, more love and more understanding about female sexuality the, in the UK than I've known back home in America. Completely. I remember when we did that scene, and, and even when I read the script, that was just the moment that it's testament to Desi and to Shulia's writing, Desi in particular, because she does most of the dialogue, is that this movie, it can be so quiet. <laughs> it can be so quiet at times. Either way. It can be so quiet. You kept it, though. So you can be, it can be so quiet at times, but it's so poignant when it needs to be. And that's how life is. You never expect those poignant moments to happen, but they happen in... In, in moments when, when you know you just say one sentence and it sums up the exact feeling in which you're you know the world in which you are I got out of their way <laughs> I feel like I created a nurturing environment where they could bring themselves to the table where they could take risks where they knew their crew intimately and they knew me intimately right. and you take the temperature as a director some actors need support and hand holding some people didn't do not want that and feel stifled by it and the first week is always the trickiest one because you're kind of feeling like all right what does each person need so my job is to take the temperature constantly and like a good parent kind of feel out all right what's needed what's not needed and with Chloe she came prepared and was ready to express herself and a lot of this work is her there's, she brought herself to the table, she brought a character to the table, and especially when it came to the sex scenes, she was very much in charge and very much had her own point of view there. And I was really proud and excited to be a part of that.
It was important to me to stay true to the tone of the book. That's the thing I loved. And over the course of the year that my co-writer, Cecilia Pergiuele, and I rewrote the, the script over and over and over again, we took it further away from the nitty-gritty like details and found our way to that tone, which was hilarious and funny and honest and heartbreaking. So um, at first we were quite loyal, but then we were like, oh, we should... Where, what, what, how did Rick lose his virginity? Like, what's his story? So then we did a lot of research, and, and then what are some of the techniques that they practice? Maybe we should have a scene that goes further into some of the brainwashing they do. So with the research and, and the people that we saw in real life who inspired the characters, the bigger and bigger it got. And um, I don't think, I think the book is, the movie is incredibly loyal in that hopefully, and, and fans of the book have told yeah. me, it gives you the same feeling definitely, definitely. that the book does yeah. without staying loyal to each scene. What's up? Yes, that was the largest line bud well, um, budget item on our line budget. You know, that was <laughs> okay. the biggest the biggest uh, investment yeah. we made was getting the rights to have four non blondes. What's yes. up? Yes, yes. Everything else, I hate score as a filmmaker, and yeah. I usually hate to use it. And it was actually my my team around me uh, who convinced me to work with this amazing uh, composer named Julian Wass, and together we built this world inspired by Chords of Canada and Radiohead, and found this sound of God's promise and the themes yeah. there and I'm really pleased that I got pushed in that direction she's, she's you, I, I told you this, like, like singing in the past has that, that been something you've she's done she's very gifted but she's not tacky so she's not going to release an album oh, no, no album it, yeah, she's album. like a really tacky oh. teen star to like be like and now I sing but she could <laughs> if she wanted. it was fantastic it's true you could if you want to I know now if you start singing I'm going to sound like I can't say it. no I wouldn't oh, I but would, she's got a really I'm not going to say I would never but I would never that's a hard song to sing along to and you I would I just wouldn't I wouldn't she wasn't even giving it her own well, you know, and she want to show off. I'm taking for you right now. She's super talented. Yeah, I'm like she's a like mom. my momager. I know you are. I know you are. You're like, like you're like a full like push. Like eventually we'll get Chloe, Cher to come so. and do a duet. And we might like, get it. Yeah. She might be doing a duet with Cher. <laughs> Like Done. So It'll be a musical. Yeah. Please. Oh well, we said yeah. that earlier actually. Thank I would do a musical. I really want to make a good. Well, thank you so much.